Coming up on Windows Weekly, it's been a big week for Windows news. We've got he said, she said, Microsoft taking on Google, Microsoft taking on Yahoo, and we're going to take on Kevin Egan from Microsoft to find about Microsoft stores and Microsoft Signature. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 194, recorded February 3rd, 2011, Signature Edition. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything Windows, lots of stuff, Microsoft, and the man who makes it possible, Paul Therott, news editor for Windows IT Pro, man in charge of winsupersite.com, and author of Windows Phone Secrets is here as usual, but Leo Laporte is not. Hey, Paul. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing. I'm doing well. Uh, I was joking around earlier with you that you uh, Leo looks a lot younger today. Yeah, and has more facial hair. Well, it's because uh, it's because he's on that cruise. I've lost you know ten pounds and right, right. I'm relaxed. Slightly sunnier complexion. Uh, yeah. So Leo is off uh, on his. He's steaming towards Antarctica right now. <laughs> Which is, I, well, I don't uh, know if he's actually uh, steaming. An he, inevitable phrase that would be said about leo at some point it's probably some sort of ion drive it's a geek cruise you know yeah uh but they're they're gonna hang out with the penguins and the geeks and we are sure. here to bring you windows weekly and we have a, a special guest joining us today we do uh kevin egan he's the chief technology strategist uh for the microsoft stores division um just by way of introduction and kevin i uh, you can chime in if I screw any of this up, but I was looking over the notes I took from a meeting we had a couple of months ago, and, and uh, I, I think the only word I can really apply to your career at Microsoft is disruptive. You know, uh, he, uh, I believe, was the first product manager for Excel for Windows, uh, was in developer relations for Windows when there were only three people on that team, versus, say, roughly 20 for OS 2, uh, worked on modular Windows that turned into Windows CE. He contributed to Microsoft, or, uh, Bill Gates' Internet Tidal Wave memo. Uh, was part of Sidewalk.com, the uh, media center stuff, um, Freestyle, you know, and the e-home group before that was uh, part of Windows. Um, got involved in the OEM business, the PC makers, um, uh, PC maker partners that Microsoft has, and uh, worked on the Velocity program. And this was the Microsoft response internally to a lot of the negative reaction to Vista because it seemed like the PC maker experience with uh, Windows Vista wasn't the same as what Microsoft was seeing internally with Vista. And they were trying to figure out uh, what was going wrong there, and that led to uh, the Signature team and also to the Microsoft Retail Stores, uh, which is basically the topic we're going to discuss with him today. And I probably missed about 21 things that you've done, but is that roughly correct? <laughs> I hope. No, but that made me feel really old, uh, Paul, but thank you very <laughs> much for that. Um, and I'm sure that we have touched base on many of those projects over the years, but it's been a few years, so it's, it's a pleasure to be talking to you today, and I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, I was trying to, I, I haven't, still haven't looked it up, but I'm pretty sure the la at the time I had talked to you previous to this was uh, probably freestyle, uh, probably the early media center stuff, I would imagine. I think that's when it was. Yeah, but, I think that's right. That's right. Yeah, so um, last month, I, I or actually, yeah, last month now, I uh, did a focus group for Microsoft where we brought in a bunch of consumers, over 40 people, and had them test basically what Kevin and his team have been working on. And maybe you could uh, describe for us you know, what that is and, and what the point of it is and, and what it is Microsoft's doing there to try to improve the, the overall PC experience. Yeah, that'd be a pleasure. So what we've been doing for the last couple of years off of some of the work you'd mentioned, the fundamentals hardware work that the Windows division um, conducts with our PC OEMs, is to really look at what makes a quality customer experience, those aspects of the PC experience that drive lasting satisfaction, um, referral capability so that people go home and have a great experience, not just the first day, but uh, two months later, six months later. 
And we found that there were some things that we could do if we worked really closely with our PC partners to create a superior Windows PC experience. Um, and so that's a part of the strategy of the Microsoft retail stores, which is to provide the best in class PCs. Um, but this experience that we call Microsoft Signature, which is the integration of Windows 7 uh, together with all of the middleware applications, core utilities, um, integrated security so that when a customer gets a PC from the Microsoft Store, um, it's ready to run, has excellent fundamentals at every price point, um, and is really the experience that, you know, I guess if Bill Gates was your uncle and was giving you a, a PC as a gift, you could imagine it would be the way he would configure it for you. So we get down in the, we get down in the weeds and make sure that um, all of the optimization is done so that uh, a customer doesn't have to think about that. They just get the best that they paid for. Yeah, I mean, I, I, anyone listening to this podcast um, has done what I do, which is you, you buy a new PC, and you may actually bring up the image that the PC maker supplies almost in a bit of comedy just to sort of see what's on there and to take the time, and it is, generally speaking, a long, long time. And then you look at all the junk that they put on there, and, and then you remove it. You know, and in my case, I, what I do is I go back to a, a stock Windows 7 install setup uh, disk, and I use that, and I just blow away. Uh, what's on there. And in many ways, what Microsoft's doing here is an attempt to replicate that and then add back the right things. But I have to say, uh, since becoming involved with this, you know, the one thing that surprised me the most, uh, mostly because I just didn't understand what the point of Signature was, is looking at it from the outside, I sort of looked at this as an attempt by Microsoft to put, you know, Windows on a PC with a bunch of other Microsoft software. And actually, I think some of the most compelling stuff that's in there is the performance optimization, you know, the removal of duplicate uh, player software, you know, things like duplicate DVD players or duplicate uh, readers for different document types, and duplicate drivers in some cases, or Wi-Fi networking utilities and so forth. I mean, can you talk a little bit about, you know, that aspect of it? Because I, I, think, I think that's the part that people maybe don't understand uh, most so far. Sure, sure. So um, first, I agree with you. There's a small group of of nerds and technology enthusiasts. Um, I think people like you and me and um, probably most people who are listening today who um, care about tuning the experience themselves. Uh, and so if they buy a new PC, they do what you and I both used to do, which is um, look at what the OEM has integrated. Oftentimes the OEMs have some software that's important for the operation of that PC. And so it can be a hit or miss decision sometimes around what should you leave on a PC, what should you take off. And even the tech enthusiasts oftentimes um, find that they better back up what they've done before they start trying to, to bring down an image and then bring it back up the way they want it. Um, and when they do that, which is what some of the tech support services in the world do today, a lot of that removal only affects one user account. Um, and that they don't have at the point of um, out-of-box experience the same degree of flexibility that the OEMs have when they're optimizing an image to lay down um, on, the, on the factory floor. And so because of our experience, obviously, with Windows and with our PC partner ecosystem, we can approach the optimization and the decisions around what's essential for a great customer experience, what's optional, um, what has the risk of impacting performance and degrading everything from boot time to resume time to reliability, um, and make those decisions not by hit or miss, but by um, instrumentation. Um, deep technical testing that started with the velocity test program that we conduct with our partners. Uh, and so it's a more fundamental approach further upstream than the typical, even the, the tech enthusiast would have access to, to getting the right configuration on the PC. But I will say this, since Windows 7 is released, um, we find that the top OEMs have made huge strides. Um, at all, and when I say top OEMs, I mean at all levels, from some of the gaming manufacturers who sell a few thousand PCs a year, to the largest PC OEMs and getting a better marriage of the, the hardware and software. And yet there is this dynamic that because the PC margins in the industry, um, because there's so many suppliers competing, have made it challenging for profitability for some of the partners. And that opens the door for introducing trialware in some cases or being tempted to perhaps pursue the bounty model for distribution of software, whether it's antivirus trials, media software trials, um, and even trying to differentiate can lead into some unintended consequences. If an OEM chooses uh, an Intel um, AGN chipset, for example, to get broad network, wireless network coverage, some of those network chip suppliers might want to differentiate from the next supplier by uh, their own network utilities, which 
um, oftentimes duplicate and can step on the integrated networking functionality that's in Windows 7. And so the consumer, even a tech consumer, is sometimes perplexed by what's the right utility for managing networks? How do I ensure that um, I've got the right coverage from a security perspective and not two antivirus programs that are conflicting with one another, which can be a big source of performance slowdown? And so using the access to Windows internals that we're familiar with, what we see from the ISV community, what the OEMs do to really light up the innovation in, in their hardware, um, we start with the OEM image the way that a Dell or a Toshiba or an Asus would build their PC. And we don't blow that away. We don't start with a clean Windows installation because there's a lot of phenomenally um, valuable engineering that uh, an OEM puts into building their best PC. But we do look at it now from an end user quality perspective when we look at that OEM image. And because we're selling the PCs direct through the Microsoft Store, we can choose to take an investment horizon that isn't about monetizing the short term by trading off some customer satisfaction or performance for um, short term revenue. Instead, right. we look at the, the goal, core goal being long term customer satisfaction. So we remove all the trialware. Um, we think that there's a there's a place to go get downloads today that's because of the proliferation of the web and bandwidth that you don't need to load up a new PC as a marketplace for um, trials. Oftentimes it's confusing whether something's a trial or really necessary. We also sometimes have held ourselves to that standard in a way that d dedicates ourselves to the customer first. Um, back when Office was distributed as a trial image, we remove Office trial from the customer's PC um, because of challenges we saw in usability of customers activating that trial. Um, we make sure that the media software is integrated so that if there's a Blu-ray player, that the codec is activated installed. Um, that if you're going to want to do advanced features like remote media streaming, that you don't have to go through that experience of opening your PC the first time and having to download 4, 5, 12, sometimes 20 updates or, or DLLs that activate some of the advanced functionality. It's all pre-installed um, and ready to go. And, and that's a very different philosophy that um, fortunately we're seeing some of our PC OEMs now a year into this, see the reaction of customers, see the reaction of uh, reduced return rates on PCs, um, and we're seeing some of this begin to syndicate into our PC community. And so we're, right. we're taking an approach that we think works for the customer. And um, in fact, you're familiar with some of the technical details. It goes into a couple of different areas that I don't think the typical tech enthusiast would consider. I, I think that as a customer, that, that would be my first question is what you've described sounds like exactly what I want when I buy a new PC. Why, why, <laughs> exactly. would, why would you allow it to be any other way? Can you explain that? Well, that's a, if you if you value the customer's relationship more than um, and and loyalty more than anything, sometimes the decision around what to do with the customer experience, not just in our industry but in many industries, can prioritize short-term opportunities for making money over the long-term value of a customer who is 100% satisfied. And so, at the at the decision to build Microsoft stores put the customer at the center with loyalty and satisfaction as the primary goals. And so we, we while it's tempting to try to remonetize the PC with, with certain kinds of offers, certain kinds of trialware, uh, certain approaches to marketing, um, we, we really listen to the customers. Even before we opened our first store, we did focus groups and statistically significant sizes of them too. So it wasn't just subjective data over where does a customer have experiences with their new PC that decrease their satisfaction from the way the PCs are marketed to the way that the box works when they open it up to the first time they try to boot it. Does it work? How, quick to, how quickly can they get to being productive or being creative to their experience if they have their first concern or problem um, or something that they don't know how to do? How does that get solved to the very end of the life cycle where they might now want to buy another device and move their information, their old documents or old media, enabling a seamless transition from an old device to a new device. And that was pretty fundamental research that we shared broadly with retailers and with our OEMs. But it was research that we put at the core of designing the PC experience in the Microsoft stores. And that led us to, I think, a more complete approach to um, designing for customer satisfaction. So, I mean, let's step back for a second because one of the things that I wasn't surprised by, but it was interesting to note in the in the focus group app, after it was over, after they had tested all the PC configurations and, you know, written their notes and so forth, I asked them, did you know about this? 
You know, were, we, were you aware of Microsoft Signature as a service or a program? Were you aware that Microsoft had stores, uh, both an online store, right, at store.microsoft.com or physical stores? And as far as Signature and the online store went, um, no, none of them, virtually none, had ever heard of either. And then I think for the retail stores, some people were aware of that. And I surmise that it has to do with the fact that uh, this is something that would have been reported in mainstream news because there's a, uh, a story there about Microsoft taking up on Apple on their home turf and so forth. And so there's something interesting to that angle. But, you know, how uh, can you explain, uh, you know, what it is you're doing with the stores? You know, because there are stores, literally physical retail stores and more are coming. Uh, you also have this online store, which, again, I don't think a lot of people even know exists, unfortunately. And then, of course, you know how Signature kind of fits into that because, um, uh, you know, when you buy a PC from Microsoft from their store, uh, you are getting this Signature image. And it's a significant difference. And that's something that, um, you know, came out during the focus groups, a, a very significant difference. Well, I appreciate that. And um, I think that there's a couple of reasons why the participants in your focus group might not have had high awareness of either the online store or the physical store. Um, one is we don't have any stores yet on the East Coast, and I'm pretty sure you're a Boston guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> you probably had people from, from Boston um, who could make it through the weather to well, wherever you held, held your focus. And you groups. don't have any up in the Bay Area either, right, Kevin? So, I mean, you're not getting all the tech pundits wandering in and, and then blogging about <laughs> it. And none in the Bay Area either yet. Um, and the yet's an important element of this because um, to go back to some of the genesis of why we're doing it and where we are today on the roadmap to where we're, where we're going. Um, it was quite a few years ago. Um, I remember sitting in one of, our, one of those strategy meetings that a big company does where the CEO gets involved to see are we, is the right hand got familiar with the left hand's doing. And um, you know, Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates are masters at that. Um, as the company gets bigger, I know it's harder to do. But it was, it was a good five years ago that I sat in a meeting where Steve made a very clearly insightful um, decision um, to guide both the product groups and the, the sales groups that it would be critical for the company's future to um, begin building direct customer connection. And at a company like Microsoft, whose success is built on the partner model, um, selling through and helping partners be successful with our products, whether it's the OEM community or ISVs or retailers, that the concept of going direct is something we approach with um, trepidation. It's one of those things that, you know, you, you've got to be careful about that. But it was pretty clear that the ability to architect the end-to-end -end experience, both to educate our partners of what's possible and for us to learn ourselves about what customers are really doing. Because if you isolate yourselves from the customer through a partner channel for too long, you can begin to lose that finger on the pulse of what customers are really telling you. And so Steve gave very clear guidance and um, that wasn't, it was strategic guidance versus a go-do. Um, and then with, with Kevin Turner, our chief operating officer coming on board with his retail background, I think we reached a point a um, little more than two years ago where we decided that now was the time for us to make a bold step um, in, in building those direct customer relationships um, and take a step that we approached very cautiously um, which was to open up physical stores. And so we were very careful about that strategy to ensure that we could open stores that would give us the chance to learn from a set of customers who might be underserved today by retailers, um, but also give us a chance to experiment and innovate and give a landing place for some of the, the new things that are coming down the pipeline before they land in traditional retail. So we chose malls. Um, and said, well, why malls? What PC retailers are in malls? Well, uh, conveniently, uh, Apple is in malls. And um, one of the customers that you might think is hardest to, to go after is that customer who has already decided that for whatever reason, an Apple experience might be for them. And so we were fairly boldly opened up our first stores um, in a couple areas where Apple stores were right down the way, hallway, and now they're right next to us in many cases. And we started in Scottsdale, in Mission Viejo, California, um, since then, we've opened up stores um, just outside Chicago. Um, we've got a store in Denver. Um, we've got a store that's doing phenomenally well in Bellevue, Washington, um, that we opened just before the holidays. And in fact, with, with seven physical stores open today, we view ourselves as on a pace, given that we, the whole concept of hiring people who could come and help us build stores is less than two years old. And, and so in our latest strategic reviews, together with uh, uh, Steve Ballmer's and Kevin Turner's guidance, we're confident now to begin accelerating the opening of those physical stores. But to be a winning company when it comes to selling direct, um, customers want an online experience and a physical experience, and they want those things to, to work well together. 
And so part of my team today builds and operates the Microsoft online store, which is a complement to our physical stores. And we actually have the online stores in um, most countries in the world. There's only a few places where we don't have a Microsoft online store, and we'll get there in the next year, places like China and some places in South, in South America. But surprisingly, the online store has quietly um, become one of the top um, online retailers for technology products uh, in the world. Um, it's a place that, well, well, there's places where you can go buy electronic software and download Windows and Office today. On the Microsoft Store, you can download a Windows upgrade for Windows 7. You can download the latest version of Office. Um, basically, all of the Microsoft software is available um, to download, and that gives customers convenience and confidence in that they're buying it from Microsoft. Um, we're not a price leader. We try to deliver service and value around the, the products, and very quietly, we've grown a user base um, where in the last six months, we've had over 40 million customers visit the Microsoft online store. Um, and we've added PCs to that store so that when customers want to experience, you know, cool new PCs, some of the stuff you might have seen at CES, uh, the first place to find it was the Microsoft store for sale. So if you were looking for a cool slate, and there was a really cool slate that Steve Ballmer demonstrated at CES from Asus, the 11-inch um, uh, slate that... Um, great processor, a Core i5 processor. Um, there's a, a slate that's uh, very, very interesting um, that uh, comes from a little company uh, up in Canada called XOPC that they build with Pegatron, one of the major ODMs. And so these new, this new generation of slates um, with some of the software and the hardware innovation that's going into them at price points that are very competitive with um, products like an iPad that are clearly have the full breadth and capability of a PC, the store is a great place to find them. And so we've carefully selected products, and on the online store and in the physical stores, um, you can come and get software, hardware, accessories, and, and importantly, services, so that if you need help upgrading your PC, we do that. If you need training, we offer a, an excellent value in our physical stores of, uh, for $99, you can get uh, training for an entire year and come into any of your local Microsoft store um, and spend an hour with an expert on the topic of your choice. Um, and so these are capabilities that it didn't exist 18 months ago. And so we're just now beginning to build awareness and we're doing it very carefully and quietly so that we can share what works with our, with our, what people might consider our competitors. But to be honest with you, the Best Buy is not a competitor to us. They're a close partner. Um, the other retailers, Office Depot, Staples, these are Costco, Walmart. Um, these are companies that if we find something that works in the Microsoft store, whether it's the service model or the PC assortment or lessons from Signature, um, we work with our, our retail sales division who services those companies to share that information with them. But we think there'll be a place in the long term for Microsoft to have a home that you can go to online, have a place where you can go to that's in your neighborhood where you can talk to a Microsoft expert, um, check out the latest, coolest products, um, get service if that's what you need. And uh, it's working for us. Our, our customer satisfaction um, after, and that usually takes time to build, um, is in the high 70s as measured by net promoter scores. And high 70s, if anyone is familiar with net promoter scores, is a world-class level of customer satisfaction. Um, and so that's what we started with as our premise and our strategy. And we're really pleased with the results to date. We're still learning. Um, but we do think we offer something unique um, for customers who want to try Microsoft. Yeah, it is a cool store. The, I mean, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, because they're close to the Apple store, I think it's raised the eyebrows of a lot of people who thought maybe that, uh, maybe yep. that it was uh, something that was past them, that they'd moved on to Apple. Um, and uh, sure. we, we find quite a few people come back to the Microsoft store after going to see what Apple's got. But I had, you know, I had two immediate reactions in the Bellevue store, which I visited in December. And, uh, and by the way, I'm dying out here. I need, I'm awash in Apple stores in Massachusetts. I, need, I would love to have a, a, a Microsoft store here, but... Um, one is it, it it's a general genuinely warmer experience. I mean, the, the Apple Store looks very it almost looks like an operating room, you know, by comparison. But that's just uh, you know my own personal reaction. But I I was also thinking immediately because it's right down the hall from a, a smaller Apple Store, and uh, I was saying to the guys there, you got to have a like a Mac signature service where someone goes down the hall, buys a Mac, and then brings it over to put you know Windows Seven on it and <laughs> that stuff, and you could get that combination of the you know the cool Mac hardware with the with the better OS and and all the application support you would get there and so forth. One of the but, best Windows machines I've ever owned, MacBook sure, Pro. Yeah, sure, yeah, definitely. Yeah.
So I don't I, I don't know if we can, can can I discuss any of the results of the focus group yet, or does that need to wait, or maybe I can well, speak about know, that it's, generally. It's j just yesterday, we put up some of those results ourselves online. Mm -hmm. Um, that okay. are available now on at, at signature.microsoft.com. And so I think given that we went live with some of that information yesterday, I think it'd be fine for you to share both what you found and frankly, your, yeah, your opinions and, and questions. Right, and, and the reason I think this is important is because like I said, everyone has bought a PC and you bring the thing home. My parents have bought both, in, uh, my mother and my father in the past year have bought a new PC and both times that thing has sat in a box on their floor until I came over and turn it on for the first time. They literally, you know, they spent almost a thousand dollars, didn't even turn it on. And then I both times spent several hours longer than I thought I was going to, just cleaning them up. You know, so one of the most dramatic things we saw in the testing was that um, a roughly five to six time shorter out of box experience, you know, across the, the seven different sets of PCs that we, we happen to test. And, uh, you know, some of these computers took uh, upwards of half an hour just to go from when you turn on the bot, you know, the, hit the button, and then you went through all the junk it has to go through, and then it did stuff afterwards, and it's sitting there churning away doing whatever, and throwing up confusing windows and subscription services and all this stuff. Um, I mean, just dramatic differences. And uh, you know, we we tested a number of things, um, users' reactions, you know, the desktop, the start menu, uh, the Internet Explorer configuration performance, um, the inclusion of antivirus, anti-malware security type software. You know, Microsoft obviously puts on there. Security essentials, whereas all the PC makers had very short subscriptions uh, to uh, competing services, you know, internet suites. And that's one of those things where I never would have noticed this because, like I said, I always blow this stuff away. But clearly something horrible has happened there because all of these things had a two-month security subscription and that was it. And it's a two, you know, I remember, you know, it seems like early on these things would have been a year and they probably went down to six months and then three months. They literally all were done. Uh, it's only two months. And then we looked at things like, um, you know, sleep and resume time, shutdown time, and so forth. And I had all these computers back to my house, which has been a, a disaster. And thank you for that, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, 14 different computers. Uh, my, <laughs> I think we're all going to be happy. It's time for a LAN say, party. To yeah, say right. goodbye, yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, again, you're just going through the various testings, you know, the, the load on the system at normal runtime, you know, the, how fast they start up and how fast they shut down and all that. And, and again, you know, not understanding the program, my reaction to this would be this is um, a Microsoft's way of putting their own stuff on a PC. But then you actually see it in action and you realize this is a dramatic difference, uh, not just in the startup experience, you know, that first day, but just also in the day to day experience that um, these things aren't just uh, it, this is not a chance to showcase Microsoft software. It's a better PC experience across the board, which is why we're talking about it here, because I think it's important um, to get this message out. I mean, people in the focus group were blown away by this. Um, 95, oh, actually, it was over 95% of them preferred the signature PC uh, to the OEM PC, you know, the, the PC maker image, if you will. And, um, I mean, the language uh, that they use to describe the two setups uh, in some cases was actually unprintable on the PC maker side. I don't want to call it any uh, particular PC makers there, but it was just fascinating uh, to see. And again, I, I, when I look at this, I think to myself, this is something that needs to be communicated more broadly. And I just, you know, I wish the people understood this was a, a possibility because, you know, I am, as are so many people listening to this and watching this, the PC support staff for friends and family members, neighbors, um, I have, I look around this neighborhood and I, I've helped half the people whose homes I can see from my house with their computers just in the past year. And, uh, it would just be, and, and I mean, every time it's, it's like crazy configuration and all this junk that's on there. And, um, I just think it's important, you know, for, uh, to highlight, um, you know, how awesome this thing is. I mean, it's impressive. It's a it's a blessing and a curse, actually, that the PC ecosystem has such diversity and breadth that you see um, yeah. the range of hardware, the range of price points, um, the performance potential at any price point. But that openness comes with a challenge to sometimes architect the end-to-end -end experience in a really tight way. Um, and what was important for us is to demonstrate that the hardware we see coming today, that you see the underlying hardware, um, and the, the lowest level of software that our OEMs build together with some of the other hardware partners really is world-class today. Um, mm -hmm. The degree of innovation in the PC business hasn't stopped. 
Um, in fact, when you get the law of large numbers working for you instead of one company who's building it their way um, to one or two people's vision, which can work for a while, they, and you may even have a home run for a decade, um, but you end up over time that the law of innovation and the law of large numbers um, really favor an ecosystem that has um, dozens or hundreds of partners who are building their approach to what a customer experience is. And so we see that challenge then when it comes to assembling software and hardware together in a really tight way. And so we, we have a wide variety of PCs that we work with to build the signature experience for them. Um, every one of them has some unique aspect, whether it's ultra wide band, um, which you know, is unique today to the PC platform or USB 3.0 or different technologies for touch. Making sense of that, if you're not a technology enthusiast, can be a challenge. And so we invested pretty heavily to, in the Microsoft stores, the physical stores, to hire world-class salespeople. Um, we've had the lowest turnover in the industry when it comes to um, retail, which is traditionally very high turnover. And when a customer comes in who isn't, isn't you or a Leo and isn't going to have a neighbor who can come help them, um, there's somebody there, if you buy a PC, who will spend 15 minutes with you to not only... Um, try to sell it to you, but 15 minutes after you've bought it to ensure that you leave the store with your email configured. Um, if you don't know anything about social networking and you're worried about privacy, they'll help you set up your social networking. And to the point you raised earlier about, well, what if the customer you know, has competing products? Um, when you take a customer first approach, you don't care. If the customer has an iTunes library and they want to figure out how to make that really integrate well on a, on a Windows PC. Um, we'll help customers with that. If they've got an Android phone and they want to have a great pairing relationship with their new Windows 7 PC, we'll help them with that. Um, and so it's really a customer first, uh, platform second approach to creating a great experience. But I'm glad to hear that your, your focus group um, was so <laughs> enthusiastic. Um, it's yeah. the reaction we're trying I mean, to get. Yep. And uh, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I, I based on what I learned about the Signature Group uh, a month previous, I thought it would be, you know, pretty positive. But uh, obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but the results were actually over the top. I mean, it was really interesting. Um, I don't know how much you can get into this, but maybe as a way of wrapping up, is there any um, anything you can discuss about the future? You know, where where these things go from here? I mean, what's uh, the near-term plans for Signature and for the Microsoft Store. I mean, is there anything you can discuss around that? Yeah, I'd be curious to know if uh, if you'd be able to expand to where the, the vendors would sell Microsoft Signature versions right. of their own own devices. Well, I think that both both the expansion plan, the roadmap are things I can give guidance to. Um, and then the relationship with our partners. Um, I, I, I know you were at CES, and we've seen already some alignment with our OEM partners. There was a, a PC performance shoot-off that Lenovo conducted that showed some of the velocity improvements that they've made. They call it the Lenovo Enhanced Experience. We're already seeing PCOEM syndicate many of the changes that make a signature PC experience better. In terms of there being a, the, the Microsoft endorsed signature experience, which comes with direct support from Microsoft um, and obviously the starting point of the best the PC can be, we do think that at some point that there is an opportunity and a, and a demand to get to scale to help get that experience to as many customers as possible, even customers who may buy outside of the Microsoft Store. Um, but in the near term, um, it's a, an experience that is uniquely available from the Microsoft Store, and it's available on new PCs. Every PC sold in our physical stores and our online stores has that configuration of Windows, has that an Internet Explorer has been optimized for faster page load times, faster initial page load, um, better security settings for the consumer profile, um, media software is better integrated, um, one of the things that surprises customers is the integration that we've done with the Zoom client, um, which connects to a very rich marketplace that's got a great business model for um, subscription-based and pay-as-you-go individual song purchases. So that experience is something we're seeing change the way that retailers look at what they might want to deliver and also OEMs the way they would build. And I do think eventually Microsoft will take the signature branded experience um, into our retailers. But in the near term, we're still in the learn mode because Signature is a great starting point for lifetime customer loyalty. But what we're learning is that it takes more than that first experience. That as customers use their PC, um, it changes. The experience changes as their kids play with it, load stuff onto it, accept dialogue boxes that the parent might not normally accept. <laughs> and so there's a we're, we're investing in the technology with, with our product support team to replicate what we have in the physical stores, which is our answers desk. It's our place where you can go and get a 
uh, free consultation for 15 minutes on what might happen. We'll fix it for you there if we can. Or you can actually purchase a service um, to fix your PC, um, to upgrade your PC, to do whatever you need. But that capability to get to scale, we think, is a, is a future cloud-delivered service for consumers. And so, you know, the guidance I'll give you on future investment in technology roadmap is the continued offering of great services in the physical stores, but the future offering of an answers desk in the cloud um, available from the Microsoft online store. So that from the comfort of your home, you can get that 15-minute console with a real person, putting a face on Microsoft's a lesson that we learned the stores can really do a great job of. So we're going to try to replicate that more in the online store. But we're going to continue to listen and learn to the customer. Um, they tell us more in one day of selling than, frankly, you can learn through um, years of focus groups. And with the number of stores we've got today and the huge volume of customers we're seeing, um, we're providing feedback into the product groups that will affect and improve the quality of everything from Windows 8 to the next version of Office. Um, but I think that you'll see us open more stores um, fairly rapidly over the next year and the next several years. So hopefully we'll be closer to your home, Paul, and you can <laughs> get out so. of the neighborhood <laughs> IT support business and yep. um, you know enjoy the, the benefits of having a store nearby. But uh, whether we get there with a physical store first or we are, today you can log on to the, the online store um, where what's really missing on the online store is that personal answers desk and the service suite that we can offer in a physical store. So my engineering team today is working to enable that in a very robust way um, for um, being an offering through the cloud. But for the customers who are, don't, aren't tech support, the best thing they can do today is probably, if they don't have a store near them, is visit the online store. And if there's a PC at your price point, um, it's the fastest way to get, a, uh, to get a Microsoft signature experience on a new PC. And I know, for example, there's a Core i7 uh, Lenovo X200 tablet that's one of my favorites because it's a 12.1 inch tablet and uh, knowing we were coming on the line today we wanted to make sure your listeners knew of some great values. Um, we <laughs> took that price down $500 today for your listeners on Thanks. the uh, Lenovo X200. So um, but there's plenty of other things for customers to check out there and um, I know that given your interest in it we're also listening to many of the industry technology enthusiasts who have tips and tricks and frankly about half of them are are untrue about how to improve your PC performance. And so we're going to work on building some social content um, through Facebook and through the other vehicles for customers who are following the Microsoft Store um, to be able to learn some of these lessons that they can apply themselves for um, PC performance, reliability, and, and for that IT enthusiast like your customers are, um, it's a good place to see what the store is doing next. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Kevin. I That's really great. appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us today. It was a pleasure. And, uh, of course, as, as if you're watching the video version, you know, store.microsoft.com, the place to go. There's also signature.microsoft.com. Is that right? Yeah, that's really, it's just a link off of the Microsoft Store that provides more information about Signature. Um, but the main place to go to check stuff out is the Store website. Um, each one of the PC pages then has a link to Signature for customers who want to learn a little bit about what we do to that PC they're about to buy. All right, Kevin Egan, Chief Technology Strategist of the Microsoft Stores Division. Great having you on today. Thanks a lot for talking to us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Paul and I have got to get to the rest of the news, and it has been a big, big week for Microsoft News. Uh, in fact, there's, there's, <laughs> yes, there's some, some news breaking today still around awesome. the, uh, the data leak on Windows Phone 7, right? Yeah, you know, uh, people who listen to the podcast know I've been uh, fairly negative lately about the Windows Phone stuff, mostly because I, I feel like uh, the team's moving a little too slow at a time when they need to really step up the game. And they're not being transparent, you know, which is one of the things I had high hopes for with Windows Phone. So a few months ago, well, actually, it dates back a little bit longer than that. When I, when I switched over to Windows Phone late last summer, I started monitoring my monthly data usage to see if my Windows Phone data usage differed from that of when I had the iPhone before that. And, you know, AT&T does a good job of providing that information. So one of the things I saw, which I couldn't really explain over the last, say, three months of uh, 2010, was that my data usage was going up, 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 you know, each month. And it didn't make sense to me why that would be. So each month, you know, at the top of the month, in fact, I'll be doing it uh, today or tomorrow for January. Um, I would just post a graph and say, here's how my data usage has changed over time. And somewhere in the comments section for that, and there was a huge thread that had broken out, uh, theories about this and things, uh, a number of people complained that they were seeing phantom 
data usage uh, that they didn't that they couldn't understand. You know, the phone was sitting idle, and the next day they could see on AT and T they'd use some huge amount of data, and they they didn't know what was and these going big on. Big chunks too. That was yeah, huge meant. chunks. Now there's all these theories about that, and 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 you know, AT and T maybe post things uh, in batches and so forth. It's hard to say, but I just I mentioned it on the super site, which is my main site, and uh, obviously more broadly read than the blog, which is why I did it. And and Microsoft contacted me and they said, hey, look, we're looking into this. Any information you have would be appreciated, whatever. And um, and then, you know, nothing much happened. I, there were various theories about what it could have been. But Microsoft a few weeks back, maybe a week and a half or so, or I can't remember the exact date, uh, announced that they had found the problem in a third party service. They had alerted that third party and they'd be making some changes. But they didn't say who it was or, you know, what we could do as users to alleviate the problem. And the reason it's a problem is most of the Windows phones that are sold now in the United States are on AT&T. AT&T only has tiered data plans. They don't have an unlimited data plan. So if you're on one of the low end plan, or I'm sorry, on the low end plan, which is, I believe, 200 megabytes per month, uh, it would be very easy to go over that limit and incur extra charges because this thing's sitting there in the background doing stuff, you know, uh, transferring data. Um, and I found, you know, through my own usage that I could never survive on a two a 200 megabyte plan. You know, I, I, I've never gone over two gigabytes, not even close, but uh, 200, 200 megabytes would not cut it. Who could me. live like that? I know, exactly. Um, what is this, the Middle Ages? So <laughs> anyway, this went back and forth. And um, Rafael uh, Rivera, who's my uh, Windows Secrets co-author, um, looked into some of the uh, suspects. And um, I actually am now forgetting off the top of my head what the first one was. But the second one he looked at was the uh, was Yahoo Mail. This was one of the ones that had come out. I know there was some theory that Facebook might have been Facebook because it's an integrated in. service and it's available on all of the on, on the phones. And um, oh yeah, right. So Raphael has just pinged me. The first thing he looked at was the feedback module. So there was some okay. concern that the Windows Phone feedback would be sitting there sending feedback. And he looked into that. He felt there's some traffic there, but nothing dramatic. So <clears throat> he looked at Yahoo Mail, and sure enough, Yahoo sends, uh, in, uh, according to his test, about 25 times as much data as it needs to send every single time it does a query uh, with the server. And uh, I'm sorry, or every time it gets a query from the phone, I guess would be the right way to say it. And the reason that this is, kind of, there are many reasons why this is crazy. I mean, there, A, there have got to be a number of users out there using Yahoo Mail. It would have been nice if they could have alerted people earlier on, Microsoft, uh, that that was the issue. They seem to really drag their heels. It wasn't until people started complaining <laughs> yeah, that, it's, well, it's, there is a problem. We do, we're not yeah. going to say who it is. And then Raphael figures out who it is. Right. Okay, we'll admit who it is. Right. Well, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So that was a Monday. I, I know this is Monday because I play basketball on Monday nights. But I was, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I Raphael published his results. I linked to it and I went to basketball. And then during a downtime between games, I checked my mail and I had a mail from Microsoft. I thought that's interesting. They had basically corroborated, without mentioning the fact that we we had already revealed it. Mm -hmm. They corroborated that it was uh, Yahoo Mail. So I, I sort of assumed when they sent the mail out that they had sent this to many people because obviously lots of people have been reporting on it. But my understanding is that they only sent it to me for some reason. And uh, that made it a little more curious as well. I mean, it, it sort of furthers the notion that, um, you know, they released this information because... Uh, Raphael had had published what he published uh, when he published it. The next day, I think, or maybe two days later, I was, I, you know, obviously this is a big deal in the Windows Phone world. I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, I, I'd been getting queries from uh, reporters from different newspapers and things. They were asking semi-technical questions. And off the top of my head, I don't use Yahoo Mail, but having written the book, uh, written a book about Windows Phone last summer, I do remember that there was, I remember there was something odd about the configuration of Yahoo Mail. You know, um, there are various ways you can get push email on the phone, but they basically break down to, you know, Gmail as a, an explicit account type, Yahoo Mail, uh, anything that's uh, what they call Outlook or Exchange ES, you know, Exchange Active Sync. Um, those are the basic types. And then they, it also supports generically, oh, and I'm sorry, Windows Live as well, Hotmail. And then um, they generically support IMAP and, um, and POP3. But the Yahoo Mail account, compared to those other top tier account types is very limited and in, in, in two major ways. One is they don't support contact or calendar sync at all. So with Yahoo, you only get mail. And two, the, the, the range of time 
which you could configure to check for mail, is different only on Yahoo Mail. So for these other push email types, one of the choices is you can have it continuously check for new mail. It will check for mail. It will download mail as it comes in, is how it says it on the phone. But for Yahoo Mail alone, the only, the lowest, like, like the least frequent amount of time that this thing will pull for mail is every 15 minutes. It's the only account type that's like that. And so I wrote a post where I said, you know, I, <laughs> they had to have known that there's something wrong with Yahoo. Why would this be different? Why would this one account type be different? You know, and I quoted from the book. I wrote, you can, you know, last July without knowing what was going to happen, I wrote, you know, there's something odd about this. They, they handle it differently, and I don't know why, you know. And it's, it's less uh, powerful or less, um, you know, uh, instant, I guess. So, you know, there's all this stuff. Yahoo uh, eventually came out and they apologized first, but then they came out and said, actually, Microsoft is sending in, you know, uh, bad IMAP traffic, and that's the problem, you know. So right, it's, because it's there, there is a different way that Windows Phone 7 requests IMAP, and so Yahoo's trying to make that, that sounds to me that's like Yahoo's trying say, to make that sound but, sound like it's different there but then Raphael today on within windows.com exactly. points out that well the iPhone has the same issue when you right. fetch an IMAP header it gets a bunch of information it doesn't need as well <laughs> so this is you know check in next week and there'll be seven more stories yeah. because it seems like this is something that's not going to die uh, uh, but honestly my biggest issue well there are two it, my my two issues with this whole event are exactly the same issues that I always have with Windows Phone, unfortunately. One, they're not updating quickly enough. You know, this is the type of thing, uh, A, if they, I don't know when they knew about this. I suspect they knew about it months before they launched the product. Why wasn't it fixed, you know? Well, if they knew about it this last summer, why couldn't they have worked with Yahoo to fix this problem? Whoever is responsible, right? Do the right thing for the customer. Um, instead, they launched the phone with a, a Yahoo Mail configuration that's different for some reason than the other account types. Um, so, there's no updating, right? There's, there's never been an update. We're waiting for an update. We're waiting and waiting and waiting. Right. We were supposed to get uh, cut, copy, paste in January. That didn't happen. Yeah. So that's one thing. But then the, the other thing, of course, is the transparency issue. You know, uh, this is a golden opportunity for Microsoft. You know, they, they shipped a product which was unfinished and has now been pretty proven to be buggy. And that's okay. Uh, the first generation iPhone, the first release of the iPhone was very much like this. But, you know, Apple updated it and updated it and updated it. And over time, you know, the, all of the complaints went away. And I, I think that I'm just concerned, you know, it would be one thing if they said in October, look, we're not going to release updates to fixes as they come out. But the first update will be in January and it will include these things. And the next one will be in March and it will include these things. You know, they, they don't seem to be able to say that. Well, it's, it's certainly, it's not like Apple came out constantly saying, yeah, we're on this, we're fixing it. They would just roll out. Actually, I, so in interestingly, <laughs> there was some of that. They don't do that anymore, mm -hmm. uh, except that I can point to an example from this year where they announced uh, what was going to come out in iOS um, 4.2 and in 4.3. Remember, this this past year they said, you know, they gave a little bit of guidance. Okay. Um, yeah. But there's actually, that's that's from last year. When, when the iPhone first came out, one of the things I did, because I was really hard on them for shipping a product that was incomplete, is I started documenting every update they made. And in the, the document that I created still exists up on the web. And you can go and look at it and find out that not only did Apple keep releasing updates over the first um, many months, but, you know, just to compare it to the, the three-month period with which we've had Windows Phone, they also actually made announcements that year about stuff that was coming in the future to address mm -hmm. complaints. So actually that first year, Apple acted in a in a in a way that I'm kind of calling on Microsoft to act for Windows Phone in this first year. Yeah, I'm which not sure is, why Microsoft's being so coy. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, you want people to adopt the platform. It's awesome. I love Windows Phone. I love it. I could never use an iPhone right now after using this thing or an Android phone. There's no way. It is so much better. But man, it really needs this stuff. You know, it needs to be updated. And I just wish, I wish it could just happen on an, a rolling basis. You know. All right, we've, we've got a lot of news to move you through, so I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, yes, and, and move us along to the, re to the release candidates uh, coming out uh, for several different flavors. Uh, yep. Are these a big so, deal? Yeah, in some ways they are. Um, one of these products is Windows Home Server. So this is the, the Veil version, the net, you know, V2 for Windows Home Server. 
it was a, speaking of Microsoft controversies, it was a big controversy late last year when Microsoft announced it was getting rid of Drive Extender, uh, which was the technology in Windows Home Server that did a number of things, but it provided a single pool of data storage. So you could plug in a hard drive. That storage would just go into the pool. Didn't have to worry about it. No drive letters, no nothing. It would just become part of the storage pool in the server. That's awesome. Yeah, it was brilliant. And it also, yeah, it, lovely. And it also did uh, data duplication automatically across two drives. So you didn't have to think about it. You check a box, everything in this folder and this share, uh, your video collection, your music collection, your documents, whatever it is, would automatically be duplicate, duplicated across two or more, I'm sorry, just across two drives. Um, the idea being that if a hard drive failed, you wouldn't lose your data. Also brilliant. Unfortunately, <laughs> they discovered an application compatibility issue, and after spending a lot of last year trying to fix it, they eventually decided that this add-in model, the um, application model that they have for these servers, because now there's a family of them, mm. was more important than drive extender, so they killed it. So what just got released was the release candidate, or a near final version, of three products that are part of the, the so-called Colorado family of servers. Next version of Windows Home Server, a new small business server product called Small Business Server Essentials, which you can think of as Home Server with Domain, which is basically what it is. It's great. And then a new version of Storage Server, which I'm not as familiar with. Uh, and you would think that having <laughs> getting rid of a key storage technology would be a problem for a storage server product. One would uh, think. We'll get there. So the reason this is a big deal is that this is that release they talked about back in November when they said, look, we're going to release, there'll be a new pre-release version. You can see how we're going to address the lack of drive extender. And what it basically amounts to is that you'll, you now attach drives to these servers, including home server. They appear as drive letters. They're NTFS formatted. They're not the special drive extender thing anymore. Um, if you have, if you want to, ex the, the problem is this, like, let's say you have a video collection being a, a typical example. So your video collection, let's say it's on the V drive. It's a one terabyte drive. There's no data duplication. It's just gone. And then you fill it up. Well, now you want to have more videos in the server. So what do you do? You could add a second drive or another drive, two terabytes, whatever it is. But you can't, there's no easy way. I'm not saying there's no way because there are actually ways. But there's no easy way to span the storage between those two drives anymore because that data pool is gone. It's not part of the product anymore. So now what do you do? So there are different approaches to this. Uh, you could do, um, well, there are different approaches, I guess. Let's just say there are different approaches. But what Microsoft has added to these servers is something called uh, the Move a Folder Wizard, which is just about as limited as it, <laughs> as it sounds. But And what it basically allows you to do is, um, with error checking and consistency checking and all that, you can say, look, I plugged in a new drive. I want that video folder to move over. I want you to um, fix all the shares so everything works like it did before and just move move it to the new drive. So if if bigger drives come out or... Uh, you buy a drive that's bigger than the drive that was in there. You can now move folders from the, the smaller drive to the bigger drive. So with, it's, with the it's, wizard. With a wizard. No. So it's, it's you know, better clearly this is, yeah. it's better. Exactly. So it's not a drive extender replacement by any means. But it's a little bit of a bone to people who do run into that upper storage limit. You know, the problem with it is at some point the physical size of the disk just gets in the way. So... Uh, or the number of disks you can add to the computer, get in the way, or whatever it is, um, it's still not as seamless or as reliable because of that data duplication as it was before. So I've got a write-up on the site. I guess we shouldn't beat this one to death too hard, but um, I'll be doing further testing on this. We'll see. And I don't know. So the, the question still remains whether I, I will use or recommend the next version of Home Server. I've been a big Home Server proponent to this point. And uh, I just got the code for that one today. I tried out uh, the small business server yesterday, and we'll see. You know, it was. I guess the message is still we need to see, but that that's what's happened. All right, we have another he said she said going <laughs> on uh, between this time not uh, between Microsoft's search engine department and Google. After Google played a little game of gotcha, uh, <laughs> they 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 said, "Aha, you're copying our search results because you." have a result for Mixel Pixel Pogod. Yeah, that was a Superman's villain, remember? Yeah, Mr. Mixel Pix. Mr. Mixel Plick or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll explain the Google side of this. They essentially, they, they noticed some weirdness going on with the, with the Bing index and thought, wait a minute, what? I, I, think they're, I think they're tracking us. So they did something unprecedented for Google. <laughs> they created false right. pages that would show up when you put in nonsense 
uh, I can't remember what it was, like BHRBQQ, something no one would ever type. And then that would return a page. So they faked this up, and they sent something like 20 Google employees home to use uh, I. A, uh, an I Internet Explorer with the Bing toolbar installed right. and Bing search, uh, search suggestions turned on and did searches for these made-up characters. And within a few days, seven to nine of the hundred of these pages that they had figured out that they had placed showed sure up in not. Bing. Pretty yeah. is that is that it doesn't sound that damning, but it does mean that Bing's paying attention. Right, and actually, I have to say though, uh, I found Google's you know springing of the trap to be a little overly dramatic, uh, given what it really was. I also have to say, and I don't get to say this a lot, but I found Microsoft's response to be credible, uh, which is this. We, my, as from Microsoft's perspective, you know, we have all these things that feed into how our search engine works. Uh, one of the very small ones is if you do what you just described, you use the Bing toolbar, NIE only, with this one thing turned on, which isn't enabled by default. One of the bits of data that gets sent to Microsoft essentially is how Google search, if that's what you're searching from, uh, responds to certain searches. So it's it's almost like they have all these channels of feedback coming in about the validity of searches. And there's this tiny thing that's less than 1%, you know, that was that thing. And that becomes part of it. And so from their perspective, they're, you know, Microsoft is saying, we're not copying what you do. But we are, yes, we, we, we look at what the world is doing with regards to search, and we use this as part of our We look at learning. search behavior, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, Google really uh, they, they tried hard to make a big deal out of this. And, of course, from our perspective as industry observers, this is the most delicious thing, you know. Yeah, right. When, when you have, like, Godzilla and King Kong going at it, you know, it's the best. But, uh, and, and by the way, they did it on the, Google did the eve of a, a, an industry trade show around internet search sponsored by Microsoft right. at which Google's Matt Cutts was going to be on stage with, um, I think it's Albert Shum or... Um, it was Shum, yeah. Uh, I can't remember. His and, name. And, and so they got into it. So there was a little... Yeah, know, and he tried to go... Personal uh, drama. Harry Shum. Um, excuse me, I apologize. Harry. Okay. Uh, for, he tried to go uh, Harry Shum into admitting that they were copying Google, which of course, you know, the Microsoft guy was just would have none of. Um, so I, I just think um, this is one of those things that on the surface sounds hugely controversial, but in real life, it's like, come on. Well, it sounds you know. controversial <laughs> when Google says Bing is copying our results. Of course, Microsoft comes back and very definitively says, no, we are not yeah, copying no, the no, results. Not. Yeah, but yeah. it puts it's it's like politics, right? You put yeah. Bing on the defensive and everything they say sounds a little dodgy because they're trying to explain <laughs> a very intricate well, part of search engine mechanics to defend let, themselves. Let's, let's look at this a different way because, you know, and maybe this is just my perspective as a Microsoft watcher or whatever. Um, I look at this and I say, you know what? Bing has like no market share at all. Google is curiously nervous about this. Why, why would they, why would they publicize something like this? This, this would be, you know, I mean, what are the market, uh, you know, comparisons you could make between someone who has sixty-five to seventy-five percent market share versus someone who has ten to fourteen percent, whatever it is that Bing's at, depending on the market. When you respond to something like that in this fashion, when you make such an overt accusation against such a tiny competitor. Discretion is the better uh, part of valor, usually. <laughs> Maybe. And Google but, I mean, did not they, I show that. I think it shows, yeah, Google doesn't typically uh, betray what I think is a, an internal obsession with Microsoft to this degree. I mean, I it's interesting. I, I don't, it might just be because it's Microsoft and that Microsoft is their biggest competitor overall. But when you look at the search market, I mean, come on, really? Yeah. I mean, even, even uh, whatever share gains Bing has made, have been in, uh, I think, what Bing would probably call vertical searches or, um, you know, these decision type things that they like to talk about. They're not not in pure search, right? I mean, yeah, Bing. I'm I'm using Bing. I'm in this uh, over two weeks now of using Bing mm -hmm. as my primary search engine as an experiment. Right. I'm going to do it for a month and then I'm, I might keep it if I like it. We'll see. So if you apparently if you use IE in the Bing toolbar, you could have an identical uh, experience to Google, and maybe that would help you stay. Maybe I could start creating my own pages. <laughs> Uh, but what what I found is 
Bing is good at a few things. They're very good at a few things. Yeah, they're, very good. They're, they're just fine in general search, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then there are a few niche type things that they're not very good at, and I have to go back to Google for, especially things like news. Um, right. But searching for video on Bing, infinitely better than Google. Yeah, um, news, by the way, is one of the few things that I think Yahoo does really well. And I know that's yeah. kind of a strange thing to yeah. say, but... Yahoo does image search pretty well, too, because they have that big Flickr pile. Image search is the thing I don't like about Bing, actually. Yeah. Uh, although Google has done everything they can to kill image search for me as well. I, I think the problem is when I look for an image is for something specific. Like, I'll, I'll need a logo for a product mm -hmm. because I'm making a promo graphic. And, of course, these image um, searches are designed for people who want to find celebrities or... Yeah. You know, the latest Charlie Sheen photo of him tripping down the stairs, whatever he does these days. I mean, it's it, so they're they're laid out in a certain fashion and designed in a certain fashion. Yeah. You know, which isn't necessarily optimal for me. But we'll talk a little bit about uh, browser share, uh, mm -hmm. similar to search engine share here in a second. But I want to thank Audible first. This episode of Windows Weekly brought to you by Audible.com, leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. They've got fiction. They've got nonfiction. They've got magazines. They've got newspapers. Uh, listeners of Windows Weekly get a free audiobook to give it a try if you haven't given audible a try it'll change the way you read books it won't you won't stop reading regular books or ebooks or anything like that it, it, it actually expands the number that you can read at least that's been my experience go to audible.com slash windows try it out you get one book for free and uh and paul you've got a pick for us right i have two picks you have two picks <laughs> so uh I meant, uh, weeks ago, I think at the beginning of the year, I mentioned the weight loss stuff that I'm working on and talked about the Gary Tobbs book, which I think is hugely important. Uh, last week, Leo, uh, in, in sort of in an impromptu fashion, got me talking about it again. I didn't intend to ever bring it up again. But, um, I, you know, there's a companion piece, if you will, to the weight loss stuff, which is food. And uh, this stuff um, is in many ways just as important uh, because... You can eat what you think is the right thing, but if you're going into a typical American supermarket and you're buying uh, products that come from these, uh, you know, chicken factories they have out in the Midwest or whatever it is, I mean, a lot of this stuff is really unhealthy. And and the king of this discussion, of course, is Michael Pollan. And uh, a lot of people have probably heard of him. Um, uh, this is just core important stuff. So his uh, most important book or the book he's probably most famous for is The Ominer's Dilemma, uh, Natural History of Four Meals, which is a great, great book. And then he has a more recent book called In Defense of Food, uh, which is also recommended. They're both great. And I, I think if you're interested in health and in nutrition and all that stuff, um, you need to understand the other half of it, which is that in the same way that we have been lied to on purpose or not about nutrition and the things that are important about uh, keeping fat off and so forth, we've also been lied to about food and um, the quality of food and where food comes from and all that stuff. And it, uh, these books are just really important. And That's a, it's and, a great suggestion. I, 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 ha I find it difficult to find good food in a, in a, uh, in a chain supermarket oh, a lot it's, of the time. It's, actually, it's you, more you, difficult than you think. You just right? have to continually read labels because what it's yeah. saying it is is, is hiding a, a lot of... If, and yeah. it's not just about yeah. additives in general. Some additives that people make fun of, the really long names, are not the ones that are harmful. It's the fact <laughs> that they just added, sure. you know, 500 grams of sugar to something that doesn't need any sugar in it. Uh, yeah, we, well, we live in a, a, in a country where um, cows, for example, are force-fed corn, which is something they biologically can't eat. So they're also uh, continually medicated so that they don't vomit up the corn um, so that they're just sick enough to be able to process it but not get killed by it. And uh, that's the meat you're eating. I mean, when you when you walk into a, a Morton Steakhouse or wherever and they talk about the corn-fed beef, the thing you need to understand is cows cannot eat corn. So that sounds really wholesome and everything. That's disgusting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is the this is the type of thing I'm corn talking about. Corn-fed beef. Corn-fed beef. You all yep. know the phrase. You know, yep. it sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's disgusting. So, anyway, uh, if you're interested in the health stuff, uh, this is... As core to that, I would say, as the the Gary Todd stuff. It's very, I think very these are a good example of books that you might want to read, but you might think, "Gosh, I just don't have time." Uh, yeah. I'd lo I'd love to to find out about in defense of food. I just don't have time. And Audible makes it possible to find the time when you're driving around, when you're jogging, when you. I do it a lot when I'm cleaning the house. 
yeah. uh, or, or, or taking out the trash. I, uh, I'm, I'm I wear to Bose. Bose headphones when I mow the lawn. There you go. Uh, for example, to keep out the sound and then you can hear the... Audiblepodcast.com slash Windows, and we thank them for their support of Windows Weekly. All right, IE8 usage up again, but overall IE uh, to its its lowest point in quite a while, isn't it? Oh, yeah. 56%? <laughs> it is. It, it's uh, 56%. Yeah, so I, I don't actually know when it was that low, but, I mean, it, I think the last time it was that low is when it was on the, the way up. When it, know, was, when it was targeting Netscape, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So. I think I, oh, I, I vaguely remember when it patched past 50% and everyone made a big deal, like, wow, Netscape's it's not in charge anymore. Big deal, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this trend from January is the same trend we've seen for the past year, year and a half, which basically amounts to IE usage overall is going down slightly each month, uh, roughly speaking. I mean, there have been some bumps up and down as well. And but IE8 usage, IE, uh, IE, uh, or as in the most recent version of IE, has been going up. So IE8 is uh, is still the by far the the most often used browser version of any browser, and interestingly also grew faster as it has so many months over the past year than a lot of the competition. So uh, one of the big news pieces from the browser market share thing is that Chrome officially surpassed 10% of the market for the first time, but IE8 actually grew faster than Chrome uh, during that standpoint. And that's doubly interesting or important because as, we've, uh, as I've tried to point out in other areas like uh, PC market share and so forth, it's easier to grow share when you're small. Yeah. So for the, for the dominant product to actually grow faster than the others, it's actually pretty impressive. You know? So um, that said, uh, obviously IE8, or uh, sorry, IE going down overall is a bad thing for Microsoft and they're trying to um, prop up the news a bit by, you know, talking up uh, the next browser, IE9, which will be available in a release candidate version sometime soon, probably this month, and then a final version, hopefully in the next uh, quarter or so. And uh, it looks like that's going pretty well, and, and it obviously looks like a great product, and we'll see how it does in the market. But, um, yeah, for right now, I would just say that the, the news for IE overall is the same for January as, it, as it's been, you know, for a long time now. Yeah, Try, same, same basic. Who, who would have thought when it, when IE was at ninety percent that we ever that would, it would ever change that we, it would ever fall? And uh, I think it's important, you know, uh, looking at the technology world and at the PC market and so forth to understand that like something like that could happen anywhere. And, uh, and I think it's a good thing. I think it, it, you know, I'm 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 not cheering yeah. for the death of Internet Explorer. I'm cheering for competition. I'm cheering for choice. I want to be able. Monoculture is never yeah, the answer. Exactly. Never. All of these browsers are better. Because we have so many, because we have Opera and, uh, and Chrome and Firefox and Safari, uh, because yeah, I, you know they the all. Thing. I mean, uh, right? You're pretty much splitting hairs at this point when you're uh, describing the the four big the biggest browsers. I mean, which one's better? And and you can obviously pick out little features in each that you may like or not like. But I mean, come on, they're all great. I mean, it's it's a it's a wonderful choice to have. All right, we're running a little long. Do you still want to talk about Honeycomb, uh, your impressions on, on that? Uh, <laughs> no, we can skip that one. Yesterday? All right. One word on the Honeycomb tablet. Where's the Windows response? Where's the Windows response? <laughs> I kinda... would say it looks, I, that's not one word, is it? So well, I would say that the, in a one word, it looks like credible. Credible, yeah. I.e. first credible iPad. Challenge. I got two words, or three words. Windows Live Desktop. <laughs> what the widgets looked like to me. Let's go. Let's go on to our uh, Windows Phone app of the week. What do you got for us this week, Paul? Okay, this one's quick. So it's it's as in it's very obvious. So finally, there is an official Flickr application. Um, it's not really what I've been looking for. I mean, I uh, since learning about Windows Phone last year and writing about it last summer, and you know, just experiencing it ever since. The one thing I've been dying to see on this phone is deeper integration of third-party services. You know, the phone ships with Facebook, like we talked about, you can integrate email from Yahoo and Gmail and other sources and so forth. But I want, you know, Google Picasso web integration into the pictures uh, hub. I want Flickr services integration in there. I want these things to appear in the phone natively. You know, um, unfortunately, developers are still looking at Windows Phone like they do other phones. I think that will change over time. So, you know, when Flickr comes out with a solution for Windows Phone, they come out with an app, you know, like they do for any other platform. And that's fine. It's just not ideal. So it is my pick because I, Flickr is one of the major photo services. It's one of the things I really wanted to see. Obviously, there were third-party uh, applications, but uh, the Flickr app, for whatever it's worth, is very well done. Uh, but I'd like to see it accompanied by 
Flickr integration into the Pictures Hub mm -hmm. because that's, you know, the big advantage of Windows Phone. Can you take a photo and upload it through the app or is it just a browsing app? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you can. And that's the point of it. It is, it is a, yes, well, that's part of the point of it. Yes, you can browse your photo collection and so forth. But that's, that's the thing. In other words, deep integration, it would be nice to select a photo you took with the camera from that photo mm -hmm. and click on, you know, share. And that Flickr should be one of the choices. Right. It's not. Um, I think we'll get there. All right, on to the software pick of the week. <laughs> this is a what is this, this is a comedy pick. Have you seen this? No, I haven't. The duty so, calls. It's this is it's a, made by a dirty it's made joke. By Epic. It is literally a spoof of Call of Duty. Uh -huh. It's not much of a game. It basically is something you can play through and. I see. I have to put know, my birth in. date in. Yeah. Well, right. It's a little. Uh, well, I'm not sure how adult it is. Like this shooting. I think it's because of the violence. But it basically, you walk through a mini game that looks like Call of Duty, and it mocks Call of Duty. It's the type of thing where a guy speaks in a foreign accent, and he says, you know I'm the bad guy because I have an accent. You know, or, or like uh, oh, okay. there'll be the, That's the scenes in, in uh, Call of Duty where the, the action slows down, and uh, you, know, you do something in slow motion, and the guy says, you would never normally be able to kill me because I'm so powerful, but now the game will slow down and you will have a chance. <laughs> you know? And uh, what it really is in many ways, it's hilarious. It's, it's absolutely worth, if you're, especially if you're a Call of Duty fan, it's just kind of a, it's a nice dig at, at Call of Duty. But what it really is in some ways is an ad for a game that's coming out later, I think um, if it's February or March, uh, called Bulletstorm. And I think the point of this is to say, look, there's this awesome shooter coming out, and it does look awesome. It looks really, really good. That is not just yet another military shooter like Call of Duty, and there's so many of those. It is something completely new and different, and it looks, it just looks awesome, you know. Um, so it's just a fun little thing. It's not, it's just not, it's not something that has any long-term value. But uh, thank you to Darren Smith for turning me onto this first. But it All is, right, I got to download this. It looks it's pretty funny. It is funny, and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's pretty well done. It says stuff, you know, this is like inventory stuff. Like you have, you have picked up 50 sheets of college-ruled paper. <laughs> you know, it's like what like it doesn't do anything it's just right. like a, it just know. well there it is <laughs> and then I, you have all the, uh, the level I, the level ups and it's it's fun i'm a sucker for good parody so it, yeah it sounds like it's, a good pre one. it's pretty well done all right well thank you paul i uh a pleasure to do the show again with you i hope you can uh, put up with me yeah. for two more weeks before Absolutely. leo gets back i just wanted to add you know um i did a report for microsoft about the signature stuff i will uh publish a story on my site about signature in the microsoft store and the experience of the focus group so you can see the results and see what uh, really happened in more detail. So that will be up sometime in the next week or so. Really, really, inter really interesting movement. And I didn't get the answer I wanted out of Kevin, oh, which is, true. which is, you know, why don't they just do this for all of it? Just say every, every, my, every Windows machine has to be sold with, with signature. Okay. Uh, so or, or make a big I can't, incentive. I can't answer for, for him, but I can, yeah. I can venture a guess, which is that Microsoft has a fairly complex series of relationships with these companies, you know, the PC maker partners. It's a tough thing to go to someone who has uh, been responsible for a lot of your success over the past 20, 30 years and say, you're screwing up, you know, that you're doing something bad, right. you're ruining experience. Um, I think, I think what, the way I think this will evolve over time is that Microsoft is sharing the results of this stuff with them. They can see the performance improvements and I'm, I'm serious. It is, uh, there was, I don't have the document open anymore. There, one of the computers went from the final click of the out-of-box experience to the desktop in like 30 seconds. I mean, it's crazy how fast they are. Um, as a PC maker, you have to want that, you know? And I, I hope that the future of this is, it's at least an option from PC makers. It's at least an option in Best Buy and other retailers. You know, you, you want to see it everywhere. Yeah. I think people would choose it if they had the option. Yeah, it, it, it seems like uh, they're going for a more gentle persuasion than, than the more bullish Apple sort well, of situation uh, they have partners you know yeah. apple can do what they want you know uh, microsoft can't but they could lead by example and i think that's what they're trying to do here all right uh don't forget folks that you can uh find more uh you can find breaking news items on winsupersite.com <laughs> like uh like the yahoo mail data leak for instance uh and don't forget paul's book uh windows phone secrets if you want to find out more about windows phone anything else you want to mention before we head out of here I think we've covered a lot today. We have. It's been it's been a good week. Good week for <laughs> next week will be barren. We won't have anything to talk about. We'll yeah, just exactly. sit here looking at each other. I'll be in Colorado next week if that matters. But I'll I, I should be able to hook up with you. Is that for the uh, the uh, home server releases? 
No, I have. This is a work related thing. My uh, my company is out in Colorado, so they don't the make they list. don't make you go to Colorado to get the Colorado release candidates. Well, okay. So curiously, now that you mentioned it, uh, it or coincidentally, HP, which of course has dropped out of the home server market, their home server stuff was based in Colorado, and I used to go out every year to Colorado to meet with HP about home server, and that didn't happen last year, and will never happen again because now they're gone. Synchronicity, <laughs> so, weird. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody, for watching Windows Weekly. We'll see you next week. Yeah. Well, so we're here. We're here in Buenos Aires at uh, what's the name of this place? La Dorita. La Dorita. Not across the street. That's La Dorita. Yeah. This is La Dorita from across. It's very good. Yeah. Very good. And Mariano Amatino has brought me here. He's from Hypertextual, is his company. Yes. Yeah. And the wine was very good. It was a Malbec Shiraz blend. It was very. And uh, in introduce your friends here. Oh, let me... Well, well he's Roger Schultz from Arthur Schultz. Ne Neolo.com, which is a company from Buenos Aires. Yeah. Uh, he's Mariano Wessler, the, the founder of uh, Digbang, the, a development company based in Buenos Aires. Development company based in Buenos Aires. Uh, and he's uh, Damian Voltes, founder of Emerging Cast, partner at uh, Argent Group. Which is a demand media uh, company. He has a demand media for the rest of the world. Right. And uh, Arshan Group is a... Uh, I'm in Yeah. In and you're Francisco? I'm Francisco. And I fix computers in order to pay for new computers to satisfy my addiction. Without Francisco, none of you guys have a business. You've got you to keep him in mind. No. So this is the cream of the Buenos Aires technology elite, yes? No. I, I, I wouldn't dare to say told me it was. No, 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 no. no. I mean, we are not like Loic or, or that kind of guy. You have a message. Loic is watching. Say hello to Loic. Uh, Loic, uh, this is Mariano from Buenos Aires. And, and I'm talking this way to make sure that you understand me. Um, no, we really love Loic. Yeah. In fact, uh, I'm here because of Luis. Luis said I had I had to hook up with Mariano, yeah. and he was he was he said uh, this is uh, you will give me uh, good kind of kind of and, uh, and I will meet everybody. This is really fun. Okay, you got a good time. This is a lot of fun. It's brought, it's recording. Yeah. It's too, it's too dark. It's too it's dark. Window. Uh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> it's okay. I'll play it this way. This is a nice restaurant. I like they make uh, chandel wine bottles. Oh. It's very different. I didn't see that. Is this, uh, what, now, I went last night to a bar and I said, I want asada. They said, no, it's a bar. There's no asada bar. Oh, okay. yeah, well, it, it, you were That's very cafe. traditional. I went to a cafe. It's very traditional. Yeah. So what kind of restaurant is this? Uh, well, this is a typical parrisha from... It's just a typical yeah, Argentine. Yeah. yeah, this is typical Argentine parrisha. Parrisha is grill. Or, or, or grill. Or grill, yeah, and it was very good grill. But yesterday... And we had the church which was incredible. Yeah. And the blood sausage. And what is the name of that cheese thing? Oh, you, you, you tried Proboleta. Yeah. Proboleta is incredible. You try yeah. the Proboleta, the Malbec Shira wine. Yes. And uh, with the flan, with dulce de leche. Oh, now this is an ice cream. This is just uh, pudding almost. Leche, it's like uh, caramel. Caramel. Yeah, but it's better than caramel. Here, you have some. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you ate it all. Wow. I'm hungry. Okay. So, adios from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. Ciao. Ciao, everybody. They say, they say ciao. I think they yeah, think they're in. Ciao. 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 Yeah, that's that's ciao. ciao instead of ciao. Ah, it's like that podcast you did called the Cho. The Cho. Yeah, yeah. The, the Cho was <laughs> so it was more not interesting than this this week in tech or something. Yeah, like it's not boring. It's not a show. It's a fun no, show you did. No. Yeah. Eduardo and I were so funny. <laughs> and in that's why they stopped doing it. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody.